Welcome to One Broken Mom, a podcast dedicated to raising awareness of mental health, parenting, and self-improvement. I am the host, Ami Quiricone. One Broken Mom is not a family show. It is meant for adults and contains sometimes adult language. The topics I cover can be serious and unsettling to people. However, I do have a sense of humor laced with a little bit of a punk rock attitude. So if you're interested in real talks about real stuff by real people so that we can all get better together, well, then you're in the right place. And so welcome. Okay, everybody, welcome back today. Uh, This is actually a super special episode. It is my 100th episode. And this is a major feat, to be honest with you. When I started doing the podcast, of course, I imagined I would continue to do that. But you don't really see, you know, you hitting your, you know, all the milestones that are in front of you. And so to be two and a half years into doing the show and finally hitting the, this, um, this major piece, you know, doing 100 episodes of it is actually kind of mind blowing for me. And so to celebrate that today, I have with me a woman who's been on many times before. And before she was a guest on the show, I had the honor and and the honor of meeting her. Honestly, she wrote a book that I picked up in 2017. That was one of several that ended up changing my life. Now she and I've talked on a few occasions since I started doing one broken mom back in 2018. And she is definitely one of your, the listeners and the viewers favorite guests as well as mine. Now, when I say that my life has changed, it's not just becoming more emotionally healthy, but even more spiritually aware over the last few years. But perhaps the most important thing that comes from all of that is the opportunity to finally unhook yourself from the yoke that many of us carry around our necks and shoulders that connects us to the burdens of our histories. And I chose that word carefully, opportunity, because not just understanding our mental health, our past experiences and becoming more self-aware is in itself doesn't generate changes. It still takes conscious actions to do work and to create some inertia in your life so that you can begin to move in a different direction. And that is probably honestly the hardest thing to do. So what keeps some of us trapped and locked in place still, even if we know everything that we want to go and everything that we want to do in this future we want is somewhere out there? Is it fear? Perhaps. But for myself, it was simple as decoding the voices of my personal antiquity that are still echoing around in that head of mine that told me that all the reasons why to not pursue my heart's desire, which has always been since I was a little girl, to write, to teach, and to be an orator. My nickname, by the way, when I was younger was Jabber Jaws because I just wouldn't shut up. I love to talk to everybody that I met. And they've always been my core talents. Um, my passions. They were the things that always made me the happiest. And when I do them today, my spirit and soul is on fire. But along the way, those embers were tampered out. And most of you probably don't know that when I started One Broken Mom back in 2018, it was actually to gather information for a book, a totally different topic that I've kind of veered off since then. But it was my first firm step toward changing my story once and for all. And through the past two and a half years, what I was going to write about definitely has evolved, just as the show itself did. And by late 2019, I knew what it was I needed to say. And by January of 2020, I had a publishing deal for a business book for women who want to learn how to be courageous, authentic, and unstoppable entrepreneurs. And through my work as a business coach and traveling this self-help journey uh, with all of you, I saw clearly that the path forward starts with each person's journey through the beginning of their lives and understanding how our legacies influence us today. Now, what an amazing... Thing about life that I've noticed, at least in my experience, is that it has a tendency to come full circle right under your nose. And it's only when you turn around and look back that you begin to see how every step was less random than you thought it was at that time. And as my guest today calls it, the gods of timing, and also one of my favorite words, which is serendipity. And so as it is with today, this woman I have with me and our very timely conversation we are about to have is also serendipitous because what we're going to talk about is her first book that she published 20 years ago that she has just reissued and it's aptly titled Who You Were Meant to Be, A Guide to Finding or Recovering Your Life's Purpose by Dr. Lindsay Gibson. So welcome back, Lindsay. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. I mean, and especially on such a momentous occasion, your hundredth episode. I know. Yep, it's pretty exciting. <laughs> and like I said, you know, I didn't plan on starting something and then quitting it, you know, partway into it. But when you sit down and you start looking at the numbers and the math, it's just like, wow, this is this is pretty, it's pretty amazing. And this season's actually going to be a bit shorter than I've normally done. My first two seasons were over 40 episodes each. And part of it is wanting to make sure that the content is still pretty strong, but giving myself time, you know, to be able to keep 
you know, the momentum that I have in so many parts, the other parts of my life that I also want to keep moving forward. So, um, but it was a no brainer to sit here and think about like, who would you bring on for your hundredth episode? And it would, you know, it was you. So to have you say yes to that is just exciting. For oh, me. So I'm thank so excited you. To be part of it. <laughs> awesome. Well, so what inspired you 20 years ago to write a book about finding purpose and, or, or trying to uncover purpose? Yeah, literally. <laughs> yeah. Literally? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> literally. I was uh, sitting on my bed um, and I heard this internal voice that said who you're meant to be. Um, and it came to me just like that. And it was sort of like, okay, what am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> it's pretty, pretty uh, uh, impactful because it was so clear, like, like a voice in, in my head. And I thought, well, I know what I want to do. I want to start a group for people, um, for my clients and other people to come to where they can discover who they were meant to be. And so I planned that. And then out of that, came the idea like you I always wanted to to be a writer that's what I did throughout my childhood and high school and college uh, I want to write a book called who you're meant to be so that what we did in the group could be spread to a lot more people um, and I had a vision of uh, stepping out my front door and seeing the number of people that a book could reach as opposed to, you know, the six to eight people I had in a group. And that was such a compelling visual uh, that I could reach that many people with the good stuff that we were doing in this small group that I decided to go ahead and write the book. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you talk about, uh, that you mentioned that uh, being a writer and, and having that desire, because I noticed while reading the book, there's a, the voice of it is a little different than the emotionally immature um, parent books that you did. And I, I mean that in a, in a positive sense, like both of the book, both of those, all your books are great, but there's a melody to this book. There is yeah. this, um, the phrasing is there's, it's, there is poetry to the way you've written it. And I'm reading this going, this is almost like a different side of Lindsay in her writing, like her expression, you know, you expressing yourself is done beautifully. Like, like as if you did find your voice, right. Your own authenticity that was in it. So um, I don't you know, know if anybody's it, told you that, but I definitely yes, saw that. Yes. In fact, I, I had a, uh, a guy contact me. This was when the, the first book was getting harder to, to um, obtain because on Amazon, um, they had stopped, uh, the publisher had stopped issuing it. So it was only for sale for, for used and that kind of thing. And so he was contacting me directly to get extra copies of the book. And he said, he said, I don't, I don't know what it is. He said, but but I like the way this book is written better than the other ones, even though I really enjoyed the other ones. <laughs> and it's true. And the difference, the difference in me is that when I wrote Who You're Meant to Be, it took me such a long time to find a publisher that the book was finished in my own voice before a publisher ever saw it. When I did the other two books on the emotionally immature parent, I started out in the writing process in a partnership with the publisher. So it was, it was edited um, and uh, not tweaked, but it was, it was edited and formed in a collaboration with the publisher, who's also thinking about word count mm -hmm. <laughs> and expense, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and clarity and all these good things. So uh, they weren't concerned with me being um, uh, melodic or singing through my book. They were interested in getting the data out there. So yeah, there, it was a different process. And uh, for my next book, I have decided that I'm going back to the process <laughs> writing it first and then finding the publisher. <laughs> oh, that's a great. <laughs> well, and I can see how that materializes too, you know, the self-help realm, you know, there's, there's a formulaic response to it. Um, you know, one of my other guests that I talked with, um, you know, she had said like, you know, she writes a book, but then publisher comes back and especially depending on the publisher, if it happens to be one of the, the um, companies that specializes in self-help or in evidence-based and research-based books, they definitely have like, you have to have like some structure, it has to say, it, and it has to have actions, exercises, you know, whatever it is that you need to do. So it certainly does kind of, you know, um, get in the way of the flow of maybe, you know, what you're wanting to say. Um, but it, like I said, I'm glad to hear that you would go back and do it because you are a beautiful writer. And so for everybody, you know, that would be reading, here's the 
copy of it. I, I know there's glare from my, my light there for, but for the video folks, um, I, you, can, you can see that it's beautiful. And I think it's, it's perfect for that because, um, you know, uh, uncovering or guiding somebody definitely needs to be gentle. You know, when we're talking about um, helping somebody um, be inspired to want to, to go in and to dig into something like that. And I think that the voice is definitely perfect for that. Um, you know, you said that the publisher stopped printing it or issuing it. Is that why you decided to reissue the book 20 years later? Yeah, um, 20 years after it was published. It came out in uh, 2000, I believe. Um, they decided to stop publishing it. And uh, they sent me a letter and said, the rights are yours. <laughs> Do what you want with it. Uh, so I, I went through a self-publishing platform. Uh, they were wonderful and uh, reissued it. So it's a second edition. It has a few extra things in it um, added to the first book. But essentially, it's it's got all the... the um, points that the first book had is just a little bit more up to date and with some extra information in there. Mm -hmm. Well, because in 20 years, I mean, it's been, there's a lot of information as it comes out towards neuroscience and mental health, you right. know, that, um, that we know about now. Um, so let's, let's talk about purpose. I mean, uh, you know, I think that there's a place where many of us, you know, uh, I, I say Gen X, Gen X is, you know, we're in our 40s, 50s, um, you know, some of us that had kids younger, the kids are leaving, we're becoming empty nesters, you know, at this point in time, that's not the case for me, but it's coming close. My son just turned 18 and we'll be moving out and I've got one more still in the house with me, but I know many of my classmates from growing up, you know, they had kids in their twenties and so they've been, you know, kind of out there on their own. Um, but there is this, you know, midpoint, you know, uh, where you just so Am I doing what I wanted to do? Am I at where I want to be? And, um, and I've seen even some people that I know personally really struggle with some, some sadness of not feeling like they know what to do next. Like there was something that they did their first half of their life, but now what it is, are they supposed to do? And um, when I think of the word purpose, you know, I, I, I don't believe everybody's purpose is groundbreaking, right? To me, its purpose is just figure out who you are and do that. Mm -hmm. um, why do people struggle? You know, why do, first of all, why do they ask themselves, what's my purpose? You know, that, I guess that's that philosophical question, you know, why am I here? What am I, what am I supposed to do? Um, but why do people struggle just in terms of it? Like, what is that? What did, what did you see in, um, when you were doing your workshops and your groups and, and speaking with people that you worked with? Yeah, the question of purpose, um, if the rational part of your brain tries to answer that question, it'll always come up with um, an attempt to explain it, to pin it down and define it, um, to ask the question, is it real or not? Um, and that's the wrong part of the mind to approach that question with, because purpose is a very emotion-based experience. It is not a rational thing that you can sit down with a piece of paper and list out uh, the pros and cons of a purpose and have it click for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, um, it's intuitive, it's emotional, and it's hooked into what I call the true self, which is the aspect of you that sings in response to certain situations and certain opportunities. And I use sing because there really is a part of the nervous system, uh, the ventral vagal nerve, that resonates with opportunities that give you energy and make you feel safe. It's pretty remarkable. It's like we have a radio set inside us that when we hit the station that has the signal for us, we have a sense of resonance and, and vibration to that. And that's an emotional experience. It's an intuitive experience. So when you think about purpose, you've got to get in the right frame of mind because the part that is rational and looks for reasons uh, will always defeat your connection with that emotional intuitive side of yourself. Um, purpose is what makes you feel alive inside that raises your energy, and, and it's a sense of knowing 
it's not a sense of uh, evaluation. So if your purpose comes along, bam, you have a visceral response to it. It just feels right. You want to dive in. You want to go toward it. There's an attraction. And that's, that's the way you have to approach it. And that's really what my book is about, is saying your purpose is inside you somewhere. And your job is to use the methods that we all have to find out what that is by sensing our energy shifts when, when the right thing comes along and by taking steps toward it that will help us to get a clearer vision of what that purpose might be, you know, in this world. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I really emphasize in my book is that although you would think that the purpose would like give you positive reinforcement every time you were on the path, which is true. Okay. Mm -hmm. But there's another aspect of our history. And I loved what you said. You said um, to, uh, to break the connection or break the link, the yoke of the burdens of our history. Love that because that's really it. We all carry the burdens of our history from our family. And when that part gets the upper hand, when we get on the path of our purpose, what we feel is not excitement, but fear. Mm -hmm. And so what I wanted to do in my book was to make sure that people understood that you could be on the path of your purpose and still feel a lot of fear. And that would be normal and expected. And there are ways that you can proceed through that uh, without giving up and without being scared to death. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that's a long answer, but it's um, <laughs> but the whole question of purpose I feel so strongly about because people have to have the trust in their inner world and the comfort with their own emotional experiences to really let that happen. Mm -hmm. Well, your example of why you started the book, your rational side says uh, voices popping into your head are not normal, so just ignore those, right? <laughs> But there is that part of you that said, no, I feel like this is, you know, this is something worth exploring. Um, you know, I've, I've described it before um, as, you know, like you said, that visceral response, you know, there's, there are two big flashbulb moments for me in my life. One was on December 17th, 2017. And I described that as my rebirth day. That is the moment that the light switch went on and everything made sense. The clarity of everything, what I needed to do, how I needed to do it all came in together. That wasn't my purpose, but that was me understanding finally what I had to do, you know, for life, you know, life changing, which included, you know, um, doing what I'm doing right now. It would take a few days, you know, weeks later that then purpose came forward out of that. It rose out of that, which is it took you a lot to get where you are today. Imagine how much harder that must be for other people because you, you and me have been digging for this. You have been mining for this. You've been working so hard to get to this place. Imagine how hard this is for people that don't even know and didn't have resources that you had available to you. What are you going to do to help them? And that was, and then it was like, well, that's my job now. Like, that's my job. There's no question about it. Like, that's what I meant to do. And that moment um, that I've used to describe how that feels that about 50% of the population or even greater will never understand, which is childbirth, you know, and I don't mean just the childbirth, but it is the moment, you know, you're actually going to have a baby. New mothers, stress out about when they're going to know if labor is starting. You know, I did it, but lots of moms do it, that you ask your midwife, your doula, your doctor, whatever, how will I know when it's real labor? How will I know? Because it's anticipation and, and everybody tells you, you'll know, don't worry about it. You'll know. And you're like, will I know? And then you wonder like, was that it? Is that it? And then when it actually happens, you're like, oh yeah, totally. I know. <laughs> like, this is it. Like now I feel silly. I even questioned it, right? Like, cause it just like you just know. And unfortunately that's kind of what purpose feels like. At least it did for me. It was like, as soon as I knew, I knew I, yeah, I didn't have to question whether or not it, this was it or not. It was like, this is it. Like I'm done. Like we're on our, uh, on our way. Um, I guess, you know, what I would want to, to find out is, you know, I looked, but yet I wasn't looking. Right. Is it possible to discover purpose intentionally? Or is it such an emotional experience that it's just going to happen whether you're looking for it or not, 
And if, even if you're searching for it, you might still struggle with, with attaining it or, or finding it. Oh gosh, what a question. Um, the thing that occurs to me is, um, will you find the radio station you want if you're not flipping the dial? Mm -hmm. Fair <laughs> enough, right? <laughs> I don't think you will. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so so we're, we're flipping the dial um, or pushing the button, whatever it is. Uh, we're doing that when we try to use our thinking brain to come up with ideas or solve the problem. It's, it's a, an important, what's an essential part of the process to be flipping the dial, okay, and listening. You can flip the dial, but if you don't listen, that won't help you either. Okay, right. so you're flipping the dial, you're listening, you're trying to get there with your thinking mind, it's not happening, uh, you feel frustrated, you can't get out of that, can't bang your way out of that box. And then at some point, usually we kind of give up. We kind of say, oh, I'm sick of thinking about this. I'm sick of trying. Um, I remember telling my sister when I was trying to um, uh, get the first book written, I, I said, I've decided to embrace my despair that I'll never get published. <laughs> <laughs> And, and it, it was such a relief to me. It's like, oh my gosh, I can put this down, you know. <laughs> but, you know, after that was when the ideas started to come. And I think I became receptive at that point to them coming. So the brain does this back room thing where you can be actively flipping the dial, listening, trying to get it, trying to think it out. It's not working. You're not getting it. But all the time you're feeding stuff to this back room brain and it is putting out the word, you know, notice this, pay attention to that, call this person, read this book, buy that book, even if you, you know, even if you don't uh, think it's something on your list, but listen, you know, listen. And that part of the brain ends up popping these things into your mind, like that phrase, who you're meant to be, but it does it in a, in a dreamlike way. Like, what did that mean? And then it's up to us to go back over to our thinking brain and say, what does that mean? What's it trying to tell me? Because that communication needs to be deciphered. Yeah. So I think, I think you definitely need both, but I'm sure there's some lucky people that it sort of lands on them. Uh, but I think for most of us, we have to be actively flipping the dial and listening. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. Uh, you know, um, I think you, you probably, even the lucky people probably have subconsciously done things though, to uh, make luck happen. Right. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, so then is it true? This is another philosophical question here that we're all born, you know, quote unquote, born to do something that's unique to ourselves. And, and how would we know that, you know? Um, is there, a, you know, a sense of personal identity that is not entirely shaped by our experiences that we had? Yeah, that gets into the realm of belief, um, and it gets into the realm of mythology. Um, I personally think that we all have a purpose, or we all have something that we're meant to do. And I say that because when people get close to it, they have that emotional, visceral experience. So we may not always know what that is, or we may not always be able to put it into words, but it just seems to me that people have that in them. And that's such a source of the discontent and the pain when people live in circumstances or live in families or live in societies where their purpose is blocked, you know, uh, because of the way things are set up and the anguish that they go through because they can't move forward because of these blockages from the outside. And then later it may be from the blockages inside. The pain that that causes tells me that they probably have something inside them that desperately wants to express and wants to hook up with their purpose, but they can't get to it. So that's a tragedy. Mm -hmm. But let's, take a sidetrack to mythology for a moment. Oh, I love there's it. A, <laughs> there's, a, there's a great myth 
that um, before the soul comes down into the earth for its life, uh, the little souls line up and before they can come down to the earth, they have to go and sit on the lap of the goddess of necessity. And they sit on her lap and she whispers into their ear what their purpose will be in the life to come. And as soon as she whispers it in their ear, she presses her finger to their mouth. That's this little indentation right here. She presses her finger. <laughs> and as soon as she does that, the soul forgets what she said and goes into the earth. And they spend the rest of their life trying to remember what she said. <laughs> so I think, of, I think of purpose as being a remembering of something that was inside us to begin with. And the proof of it is that we get the emotional visceral experience. And also we feel anguish when we can't do it. Yeah. And I, you know, I have to admit right there, that's actually bringing tears to my eyes. Like just the thought of all of that, because I, you know, it, it part like, so I think about forgetting and how maybe forgetting is important because to achieve purpose is the journey, you know, to be, to be handed it right from day one and, and put on that path, you know, you don't have enough of life to really probably be able to fulfill it as, as strongly as you could or with as much power as you can to give it back to the world, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and I've always liked, you know, like I said, I'm, you probably hear it in my voice right now, to think about that is probably been one of the biggest struggles, but been one of the biggest gifts is to be able to look back on a, on a life that maybe didn't go as well as you had hoped, um, circumstances that you didn't want to have had to have lived through. Um, but then to arrive at where you are and going, I can do all of this now because of all of that stuff, because I didn't know what it was and I had to find it and discover it on this realm and in this plane and fight my way to this really beautiful place that I feel like I'm in right now. Yeah. Yeah. And I would also say that part of your purpose is working with people who uh, have had the very experiences that you have, you know, have felt the very blockages or the delays in purpose or, um, you know, the frustrations. I mean, part of your purpose involves understanding that for the people that you're bringing it to, you're bringing your help to, you know? So mm -hmm. how could you really do that authentically unless you had been through those experiences? Someone else like a uh, you know, a child prodigy or an inventor or whatever, or, uh, you know, a physicist, you know, a, a genius at the very early age, their purpose entails hitting the ground running and paying attention to what they're thinking about. That's what their purpose demands. It doesn't demand going through struggles so that you can be authentic about them when you're helping other people. Theirs was to contribute to science or, you know, whatever. So, it doesn't look like it at the time when we're going through it. But when we look back on it, like you're saying, that's when we can see I couldn't be who I am now helping the people that I can help now if I hadn't consciously experienced these blockages and these, these um, uh, obstacles in my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If we have to start turning the dial to start to figure it out um, and to kind of see where that radio signal is. Um, what are the questions that we might begin to ask ourselves? What might people that are listening right now start to, you know, tumble through their heads to see if they're, if they're on their dial. I mean, I know we've described that it's visceral. You'll know if you're on your dial, but if you're wondering, are you two clicks away from it, 20 clicks away from it, you know, how do we start that self-examination? What are the, what are the questions that you suggest? Yeah. Well, the, the first thing I want to point out is, is how the process works. Um, if you imagine, I used to have a, a prop in my, in my group, which was, a, it was a, I have no idea, it must have been full of M&Ms or something, but it was this plastic tube that had two cap ends and it was full of, I put marbles in there, all multicolored marbles. And if you uncap one end and tilt the tube, a marble will come out. Okay. So what happens is that if you think of these um, marbles as inspirations or opportunities or uh, just things that cross your path, if you take a marble out and you say, oh, it's a green one. I don't, I don't like green. 
Um, I'm not taking that. <laughs> so you put the marble back in and you cap it, okay? Yeah, well, what you don't realize is that the sixth or the 15th or the 20th marble was the red one, okay? But you can't get there unless you remain open and receptive and accepting of all the marbles that come out before then. You don't have to do all of them, but you have to say, oh, green marble, cool. Okay, that goes in my little dish here. Um, purple one, cool, that goes in the little dish there. Doesn't click, not clicking yet. But when you hit the red one, you know that that's part of it that has, that has a message for you. And then you can go on from there to have other ideas. But you gotta keep taking, it's like brainstorming. You don't throw the ideas out, you don't uh, dismiss them, you just keep putting them in the dish uh keeping cognizant of them and then at some point you will have that experience of the recognition or the click so that that's the first really important thing the second thing is that you can tell when something from your purpose arrives because you will have a very distinct experience of your energy rising lifting okay that's better than anything uh that you can do to tell you when you're on the right track. It's unmistakable. You, you feel like your energy goes up. You feel um, like there's a rightness about it. Uh, you feel like you could do it. You feel capable. You feel interested, fascinated. You, you feel yourself being pulled forward, like what's the next thing I, I wanna do with this? Or I could do this or this or this. Your mind starts going. And so that tool of energy shifts is probably the most important thing uh, that I encourage people to pay attention to. And of course, when we're growing up, this gets now into the emotionally immature parent part. But if you're raised by emotionally immature parents who are all about maintaining their self-esteem and maintaining their emotional stability and the child is supposed to contribute to that, not their own growth and development. Those kinds of parents will often um, create a situation where the child can't listen to their inner world. Mm -hmm. Or if they bring up their ideas, the parent may dismiss it because maybe it's a little frightening to the parent, or maybe the parent feels envious of that, but the child gets shut down. So, as part of our process, um, whether we're trying to find our purpose or we're trying to recover from this kind of parenting, we have to take our inner world completely seriously and realize that it's where everything begins. And we have to feel what it is that it's trying to tell us um, because it, it's talking to us all the time. But we have a lot of training that says to dismiss it. So we have to counter that. Mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it makes sense that, you know, after starting with this book that you would go down, like you would eventually write the books about the emotionally immature parents, um, you know, for that reason that um, I can imagine that, you know, through your practice and through working with people, you know, trying to get people past this point of this inner world and then going, why am I conflicted with my inner world? Oh, let's take it one more step back. It goes to how your parents treated, you know, your inner world um, or told you how to believe, or in some cases just um, made you doubt yourself. Uh, because again, you know, as children, um, the consequence of not following along with our parents is the risk of abandonment you know, risk of loss of their love, you know, whatever the, the cases may be. Um, so, it, you know, they said retroactively going back and seeing why you would write two more books about that, like makes complete sense here. Um, but what are some of those major consequences um, to our sense of identity of our authentic selves when we have that family dynamic? I mean, you talked about like we doubt our inner world, but, you know, how do we, how do we end up growing up in a way that um, de denies that authenticity? What are some of the things that you see? I mean, I, I, um, I know you and I have tackled, you know, shame, guilt, doubt, low confidence, um, that kind of uh, battle or argument. 
inside of ourselves. What else have you like, have you seen, or should we just talk about those as being the major, the major ones? Yeah. Um, yeah. If we go back to the thing that, you know, the goddess told us what we were to do. Um, that, that's, that's a pretty high authority in the, in the myth, right? Yep. Okay. <laughs> so there's going to be a, uh, you know, tremendous internal push toward that, which may run into what the parents are, are interested in or what the parents have fears about um, or what the parents want to control. So it, from the very beginning, if, if we land in a family that has parents that uh, have those kinds of anxieties and inabilities to empathize with their children, if, if that's what happens, then you are listening to the voice of the goddess, so to speak, and somebody is telling you it's not worth anything. It's like, talk about the cognitive dissonance that that causes in somebody. Oh my gosh. I mean, how can this be that, that what is so self-evident to me is regarded as something that uh, is not at all valuable. And in fact, it's kind of annoying to these people that, you know, I love and need. So that experience is so troubling that what we end up doing is we end up creating these parts of our personality whose main job is to suppress what we originally knew about our purpose or what we originally sensed about our purpose. And these protectors are there to just, and I, in this book I call it the ego, it's there to undermine our growth. It's to keep us from trying. It's to discourage us. It's to tell us that we should feel guilty for not being loyal to our families and that somehow our growth is an action against the people we love. It tells us all these things because it wants us to stay safe. But that part of the personality may be five years old. It may be eight years old, may have been a 13-year-old, had a really bad experience when they tried to spread their wings. Um, so we have to understand that while the growth impetus is there, if it doesn't meet with a receptive environment, it tends to get uh, pressed down by the environment. But we also turn against ourselves in an effort to keep ourselves safe. Mm -hmm. I, I had thought about this and I've, I've explored this, you know, my own feelings about this for a couple of years, again, really three years here of hardcore self-examination. And, you know, I've had to ask myself or, or talk out loud sometimes in the shower um, about what lingering feelings carried through once I felt like my true self was not allowed, you know, was and and, you know, I did have a, an experience. So when I was about 12 years old, um, I had finally been at a school, one, one school for more than two years. I had actually had gone through kindergarten, through my senior year in high school, and went to 14 different schools. Mostly because, you know, poverty, having to move around, you know, being sent to go live with family members for a while, you know, whatever it was, because it was just chaos going on, you know, with, with, my, uh, with my mom and with my family. So you finally settle down at a school and the girl that started off in life liking to talk to everybody finally turned into the girl that didn't want to talk to anybody, you know, just was very quiet, reflective, very observant. You know, I wasn't going to be here long enough. I needed to see what was safe because of many other traumatic experiences before that that made me very leery um, of people and also, you know, being uh, teased for being a talker. So you, you turn that, that off in your head, like, okay, if I don't, I don't want to be the butt of the joke, so I'm going to stop being the talker. I'm going to be a little bit more quiet. And by the time I got to 12, there's a, there is a point here to the story. Um, I was identified as gifted, um, took the test, took the examinations. And then I have people sitting here going, we need to get this, this girl on a path of enriching her life and her experiences. And I chose writing, 
you know, because I had already been writing and it was something that was passionate for me. And I actually started working with a poet in residence in my small town, Patricia Traxler, and learning the skills to develop creative writing, short stories, poetry, music lyrics, you know, whatever it was. At one point, I was invited to go to the library and to listen to a couple of the other local poets in town. And they're all adults. And I'm the only kid in the room. But my mom went with me because I was a kid and I needed a ride, you know, to get to the library. Sitting there, I'm listening to these poets and they're, they're contemporary poetry. You know, they're not the poets that my mom grew up with, with every other line rhyming and, you know, have a story or whatever. So they're unusual, they're, but they're expressive and they're, you know, they mean something to these authors and these writers. And the entire time my mom is ribbing me and poking me in the side laughing. Like mm -hmm. she's, she's mocking these people. And she, and at the same time, she's mocking me and humiliating me like, but unaware you know, like it doesn't even register for her this behavior and what it's doing. But I remember that because it, it, it gave me such this deep sense of shame of who I was. Right. Like my own mom was sitting here in a room of people who could be me at some point in my life. And they were a joke to her. And after that, she kept talking about it. Like I believed the same thing that she did too. Weren't those people ridiculous? That was the worst experience of my life is what she would say. And she would say it even as recent as, you know, being an adult. Remember that one time that we went and saw that? Oh my God, that stuff was terrible over and over and over again. Um, and that stuck with me right there because what do you do? You don't stand up and say something back. You don't, you know, you're, you're being rejected. So maybe your own dream there is ridiculous and maybe there is no value to it. And then in the course of the years, because I showed, um, a strength in math and science. Well, then the family put the pressure on for me to go into engineering instead. And why? Because it would be money. You can make more money doing that. You need to, you know, do that. Don't be, don't do writing. Writing is not where you're going to make money and those people are weird and ridiculous. And so it was on. And what happened was that the goddess was speaking to me and I was getting mad. Like I, I you know, I tell everybody that the, my secret ingredient in my life was this is this underlying anger of not being able to be, because eventually it wasn't just that I couldn't be who I wanted to be, but it manifested into having to trap that angry part of me down inside and not let her out, not let her fight back, not let her, you know, use that intensity to do something good. And I wondered for many years whether or not what I needed to do was let go of my anger but then I sit there and I thought, but my anger is fuel. Like my anger against the things that are injustices that I see happening to other people or to myself is, is how I, I create momentum. It's how I create movement. It's how I personally create change. And I think that what I had started to, to decide was, do I need to learn how to let her out? Mm -hmm. You know, not tell her that she doesn't belong at the table with all the other emotions, but let the very powerful person that she is finally be free to go in and, you know, fight for other things and for other people. Um, and so, you know, I guess that's a long winded way of saying that, like, you know, coming out of sometimes out of all of that, I, I just wonder like um, that true sense of who we are having it been undermined um, that sometimes it's, it's not always fear of, you know, of fighting against the family system. I guess it was fear originally, right? Like my fear was, is that my family wouldn't love me and I needed to do what they wanted me to do. But it was also equally met with this locked in anger of, but I want to do it. And how do you resolve having those two feelings sitting inside of you at the same time? You know, cause it definitely, I think from a physical standpoint, having that anger inside of me poisoned me. Like I ended up with rheumatoid arthritis and my flare ups happened when I felt myself trapped by people around me that were not letting me be who I wanted to be. And I, and my first voice was don't do anything. Don't say anything. Just, you know, wait until it gets better or, you know, find some other ways and, and not letting, you know, the angry teenager, I guess is what I call her. She's that part of me that, you know, that built up this simmering rage, you know, through her life. And I say all that with a smile on my face. Cause I mean it like, you know, <laughs> like I, I, Part of that purpose was to be able to, at least for me, I think right now it could change in a few years, but part of purpose was to be able to let that true self of, of mine out, which was a fighter, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, um, in a way you were uh, fortunate that 
the way you went, at least that way that that part of you went was toward the anger and toward the fight. That is uh, because like you say, that gives you the energy and it gives you the momentum. And of course, you know, here come the gods of timing again. Uh, as you go along, if if that if the fires excuse me if the fires of that anger are banked a little bit, you know, it it becomes a, a campfire, you know, that you can warm yourself by. And then as you get older, you get more freedoms, you get more opportunities, you get a better brain, um, and so you're able to use that then in avenues that you might not have been able to find as as a teenager, of course, yeah. But there's another, um, there's another possible outcome that I wanted to mention along these lines, I mean, and that is that sometimes people, and this is actually pretty common, um, people will get in touch with uh, something that feels like their purpose or who they're meant to be, and their reaction to it is they will also have this fear that something terrible is about to happen. Okay, now that's different from the anger that they're not letting me do what I want to do. This is more like something terrible is going to happen if I if I pursue this. Um, and I remember when I was uh, getting, <laughs> it's funny now, but it wasn't funny then, uh, when I was getting ready to publish uh, the first this first book, I remember sitting on the couch with my husband saying, what was I thinking? I can't do this. What's going to happen if this gets out there and people don't like it? What's going to happen if my family thinks that, you know, I've, I've you know, uh, exposed stuff that I shouldn't have exposed? And I was really in a panic. It was like, I've got to stop this because it felt to me like something disastrous was going to happen. Actually, it was the start of a whole new writing career. Um, but uh, it was pure self-expression, whereas my psychological career was about helping other people, okay? Now, that provided good cover from my fear because in my family, as long as I was doing it for someone else, that was good, okay? <laughs> so mm -hmm. I could be as creative as I wanted as a psychotherapist, but <clears throat> if I chose to be creative as a writer, that was a little too selfish. Mm -hmm. and that was terrifying. So when people have that fear that something terrible is going to happen, or they have a panic attack, that's practically what I was experiencing on the couch that evening. It may, it may mean that you're really on the right track. Uh, it may mean that you're right on it because the protector part of our personality that's trying to keep us small and safe, that would be the, the ego part in, in the book, that protective part is convinced that we are creating our own demise when we plug into our authenticity and when we find our purpose. It's like, this does not go together with you being in the family or you being who they think you are. So get ready to die. I mean, it's really, people yeah. think I'm going to develop a, a terrible disease, I'm going to die, something awful is going to happen. I mean, it, it gets pretty literally horrifying what people come up with. And it's very important to ask yourself that question, is this coming at a time when I recently have plugged into something that was the real me? And because it goes hand in glove with that. I, my mind is blown that you just said that um, because back in January um, when I finally, you know, got the word from the publisher that, you know, we were doing this, that the, you know, that, and, and it was like, you know, I'm literally jumping feet off the ground, you know, just because it is, it's like, oh my God, this is what I've literally dreamed about my whole life. It's coming within days. Uh, I got sick like physically sick. And then I was certain that I probably had cancer and was going to die and was never going to see my dream come true. Yeah. Like instantly. And then I had to like rationalize that, but it was, and I sat there and I'm like, what the heck? I mean, where did that come from? Like where, you know, and, I, but it was really, I mean, so to hear you say that, I was like, well, now I don't feel so alone, but it really, it was weird. It was weird to sit there and go, you're here. Okay. But guess what? 
you don't get to keep it. You're going to be dead before the book is published because now you've developed, you know, and of course I, I went to three doctors. I had everything. I mean, there was a real physical response that was part of it was truthful. You know, there was something going on, but the mind blew it up into something totally, totally different, you know, um, into yeah. like never, never making it happen. Wow. I thought that was just me. <laughs> No, no, it's everybody. In fact, there's a whole section in the book about the big fear mm -hmm. um, and how that is such a predictable response. One of the things that, um, that I was particularly pleased to be able to offer in the book is what I call the map of growth. And that is a, it's just a, a simple little map, but it shows the steps that we pass through on our way to coming to our success. And by the way, success can be in any area, like it could be career, but it could be, it could be spiritual, it could be relationships, it could be recreation, it could be uh, physical, uh, health, whatever. But whatever the success is that we're heading for, there are all these little steps, like it, it starts out with dissatisfaction, and then we go into a sense of longing, and then we start actually dreaming about something that we might like to do, okay? And then we get start gathering information, and then we start planning, okay? Now, so far, so good. This is all fine with the, with the ego. It's cool. You know, like, have fun. <laughs> you know, do whatever you want. Good girl. But then the next step is action, that's when you take the information that you've gathered, combine it with your dream and start thinking, okay, here's how I could do it. And now I'm going to take this step. I'm going to make the phone call. I'm going to do the thing. At that moment, you're particularly liable to have a panic attack along the lines of the big fear. Okay. So right before action, when it's about to cross the bridge into the real world, not your, not your fantasy world, that's when we get those panic attacks. Then if we, work our way through that and we keep going the next step is persistence and endurance that's a long step <laughs> <laughs> it takes a long time it's kind of those are kind of the workhorses of our of our manifesting our dreams persistence and endurance but what happens is when people get over the panic attack of taking the action they start moving into being persistent enduring the, the long haul for making it a reality, they start to think to themselves, this shouldn't be taking so long, or this shouldn't be so hard, or could this really be my purpose if it feels this bad, you know, if I'm this tired or is this demanding? And at that point, they begin to have a, oh, they have a panic attack because they think, oh no, I've been wrong about the whole thing from the very beginning because this is really hard. This doesn't feel like fun. I must be on the wrong track, but that's an ego panic attack that's saying, uh-oh, she's getting really close to success. We've got to stop her. She doesn't realize she's headed off a cliff. Okay. <laughs> so those two places are, are extremely vulnerable to panic. But if you know the map, it's like that you have to go through these cities on this road to get to this place. When the panic happens, you can say, okay, I'm three-fourths of the way there. Or I'm seven-eighths of the way there. This is what happens on this stretch of road. You know, it's a bad stretch of road. Have to expect it, but it's still on the way to where I'm going. Mm -hmm. That's really, um, that's really amazing. That's useful. Like, and that's amazing to think about that uh, you're able to uh, anticipate where all the tension is going to actually be. Um, because people don't realize that that tension is normal. Like that tension, like you just said, we read it as the signal that we need to heed. And that means that we're, we're doing something wrong, which it kind of is, but it's also based on, you know, a, the situation, that, the whole point of this whole thing, which is all those signals are based on things that have really driven us away. Some of us, you know, some people didn't have to deal with some of the stuff that we were hurdled with. Um, but that that signal is not a, an authentic signal. It's a signal planted in there by a parent, a dynamic, you know, something else that happened, a repetition of an experience that was dangerous as children that is no longer relevant to us today as an adult. Um, yeah, you have, to, 
you have to remember too that um, that part of the personality that the big fear comes from is a child. I mean, it doesn't have the brain power, it doesn't have the life experience, it doesn't have the self-soothing ability to deal with any of those challenges. It's like you pop back to your seven-year-old self with how daunting everything was uh, at that age. Yeah, so it's, it's like, a, it's like a, a, those panic attacks are like a bit of time travel. It's like, wow, I get to see how I felt as a seven-year-old. This is it. I'm in it. <laughs> yeah. But your job is, <laughs> is to uh, observe that and be able to create some separation between you and that terrified child and be sympathetic and be caring about it, but carry it along with you as you keep on the map of growth. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, one of the things that you, that you ended up covering here, because I wanted to, um, to find out like what were the obstacles that people have when they're trying to, you know, not just learn about where their sense of identity is, is likely built upon uh, around these experiences and not always in alignment with that true self that, you know, that mission and purpose that, you know, the goddess gave us at some point. Um, and then, you, so you talked about it, it's like these panic attacks, these expected fears that we're going to confront that are usually a good signal for us that we're, we're onto something here. Um, we do hear though, people talking about how if you want it bad enough, you'll find a way to do it, you know? And I, I always wonder, is that actually a fear statement? I mean, given, you know, what we, we just know about everybody's experiences and, and, and how people have, you know, come and gone through different, you know, through life in different ways. Is it, is it possible that there are people that really do want it and can't find a way to do it? Okay. So if we think about that statement and where it comes from in us and the statement being, well, if you really wanted it, you would have done it by now. And I, I put the by now part on it because that's what the ego tells us as part of its uh, fear program. And so we say, oh, well, you know, it, the problem must be with me. I didn't want it badly enough. And, and you know, to be fair, there's been a lot of literature that uh, points up the importance of the will and whether or not you want something, you know, badly enough. And I think that's a real disservice because I think you can want something very badly, but at the same time, either circumstances or your own, the severity of your own fears can block that. So no, it's not a, it's not a question of, I didn't want it bad enough. It's the things that were blocking me were bad enough. Okay. Um, if I'd had opportunities, if I'd had mentors, if I'd had um, some kind of comfort as I was trying to do this, then maybe I would have been able to do it. But if I didn't have that, it's wrong to blame myself. So when you have a state, anytime, <laughs> I tell this to my clients all the time, I tell them, if it really feels bad, it's not true. You can just take that to the bank. <laughs> So a statement like that, I didn't want it badly enough, otherwise I would have done it, makes you feel bad inside, right? Mm -hmm. You feel the depression, uh, the lowering of energy, the hopelessness that goes along with that, like, uh, you know, I've lost my chance. So when you feel that bad feeling, then you know that the ego is speaking to get you to stop, Okay. Because what's the outcome going to be if your energy goes down, you lose your momentum, and you feel like it's your fault? You're uh, going to you stay right where you are. You're going to stay right where you are or go backwards, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think a thought like that, you have to ask yourself, is this coming from this destructive ego voice that's trying to you know, keep me back? Or is this coming from a realistic assessment of circumstances? So when I said to my sister, I'm embracing my despair, <laughs> I was really going into uh, letting the ego have its way for a while, um, which gave me room for that backroom brain to do its own thing out of the limelight, which was actually a good thing. So it can work for the good in that way. 
-hmm. but yeah, you, you have to realize that um, we're in a partnership with life and we do depend on other people. We do depend on other circumstances. We can go out and find them. We're not destined to be a member only of our family of origin. And so there's a lot that we can do. And sometimes it's okay to feel defeated. You know, sometimes it's okay to embrace your despair. It's giving, it's giving your backroom brain time to let things gel a bit. So don't feel bad about that. But, <laughs> but keep in mind that that's not the voice that you want to keep listening to. That's a good point. Uh, you no, know, and it, there was something else that um, that I had wanted to to ask you about here because, you know, as my little diatribe a little bit earlier a few minutes ago about how like I you know I found a place in my life where I was ready to walk off the family stage, the theater, that of everything in the drama, that everything that was involved in it. Um, but what I found was interesting was even after you know that happening many years ago of just saying I'm done, I'm moving on with my life, I still didn't do what it is I wanted to always do. Like I had gotten off path, you know, and even I had even put writing down. Like I was no longer journaling. I wasn't writing poetry anymore. I mean, all of that just kind of got like locked in away in a box. And every once in a while, if I did some wordy post on Facebook, in, instantly people would compliment me on the writing. So it never clicked to still just go back and, and do it. It was like the messaging was so well cemented in my head that I had a very practiced way of rationalizing the do's and don'ts of, you know, don't change everything that you're doing now and, and become a writer. Don't, don't do that. Continue on the path that you've already been on. And so is that the ego part that you keep talking about there of like the rationalization of uh, the blocking of me ever even coming to an awareness that, you know, why not now? You know, why aren't you still doing this? Why do you dabble in it, but yet you're not reconnecting that back to your yourself, you know, and back to your passion? Yeah, because even though you were outside of your family, um, the culture also, uh, culture and your your friend group or your, your community group, um, that also has a lot of these sort of... Um, expectations, uh, cliches, little sayings that, you know, talk about uh, how you're not being realistic, um, how you're being a daydreamer, or you're being selfish, or you're not thinking about other people. There's a lot that's out there. Uh, even if you've completely left your family, there's still these messages out there. Um, but you carry inside you that now anonymous ego voice, which originally came from your family. I mean, you, you don't hear people talking in your head with their own voices. You hear your own voice, which says, this is silly. You know, don't be ridiculous. Isn't this the dumbest thing you ever heard of? That's coming to you in your own voice. It gets translated into, oh, this is my thought. This is what I believe. It's like, no, it's not. It's what your mother said to you during a poetry reading, but it doesn't, it doesn't get filed in there under what mom said. It gets taken on as what you think. So, you know, we have to parse a lot of our own automatic thoughts in order to get where we need to go. And the way we do that is by asking yourself, how does that thought make you feel? And if it's really bad, I don't believe it. That's awesome. So if it makes you feel bad, don't believe it. Because that's that, that yeah, inner if voice. Feel, if it makes you feel really bad. Mm -hmm. If it makes you feel bad in that, oh, I feel guilty that I said that mean thing. Cool. Okay. That can be fixed, right? With an apology. If it can be fixed, if it's signaling something that when you think about it later, you think, yeah, that was really against my values. Okay, that's good, that, that all works. But when it makes you feel like you're not worthy, it's hopeless, your life is over, you were stupid to even think of this, that's a really bad feeling, right? Mm -hmm. That's not pointing the direction toward, here's what you do about that. You make an apology or you, know, you restitute or whatever. 
If it just makes you feel awful about yourself and your life, that's the ego voice. Mm -hmm. Right. The don't do it because people probably don't want to hear what you have to say. You probably don't, you know, there's, it's too competitive. It's, there's too many people doing it already. Like you can't make the money or whatever it is. Oh, it's so, so don't try. Yeah. The ego voice is so clever. I mean, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Like I had a, um, uh, on, uh, during the growth group, I had this woman who uh, did her creativity through stained glass mm -hmm. and she was seized with this impulse to do her stained glass on a Thursday evening. Okay. And her, she was so excited because she had this idea. So she was going to do it. And then her ego voice comes in and it says, that's really great. That's a really great idea. You really want to do a good job on that. You know, it's already eight o'clock on Thursday night. Why don't you wait until Sunday afternoon when you have lots of free time and then you'll be able to devote yourself to it without any interruptions and you can have all your stuff at and it will be much better. And she says, oh, great. Well, you know what happened on Sunday afternoon? The impulse had passed, mm -hmm. you know? It, so it, it is so clever. It says, hey, I'm on your side. I'm, I'm just trying to help you here. <laughs> and we have to realize that when we kill that little shoot of grass that starts to poke up, which is our little inspiration for action, okay? When we smush that for some rational reason, it's just as smushed as if we had come up with an irrational reason. So you have to be aware that when you kill an impulse that is going in the direction of you finding your true self, that you can't, um, you can't undo that. It, it really gets killed in that moment. And our job is to say, no, I'm not listening to that because I feel like doing it right now. And if I don't act on this right now, I'm going to lose this feeling. And then if you can't work until, you know, one o'clock in the morning, you work for an hour on Thursday evening and you feel good about it. And it's just taught that fearful part of you that nothing bad happens when we do something that is in alignment with our purpose. Mm -hmm. Yep. I like that, you know, because I, I, it does happen. I, I know it's happened with me and I'm sure it happens with lots of people you know, you've got that spark and you, and you want to be able to pursue it. And then instantly the arguments about why it can't be done or why it shouldn't be done. And, you know, now is not the time, you know, really does sequester it. And you always wonder like, what if, what if I had, you know, how different, because I know that the times that I've been able to move myself forward are acting, like seeing it and jumping on it right then and there, you yes. know, and it really does make a difference. You know, then you're just like, man, I need to do that more, <laughs> you know? Um, and it becomes like self-fulfilling and, uh, you, know, it, you know, that energy, inertia, you know, it's a word I use a lot because it is momentum, it's movement, um, but it does require, you know, um, sometimes going, yep, I'm gonna do it now. I'm gonna send this email right now. I'm gonna say this thing right now. I'm gonna follow up with that person. I saw that, I'm, you know, I'm moving on it really quickly. Um, I know in my, my life experiences, sometimes I've been able to redirect quickly and then get someplace fast. And it's, and it's been that it's been the, the idea of being able to move. And, and once I see it latching onto it right away and not letting that horse, you know, race ahead of me, you know, without being able to get my hands on it. And, um, and, I, but there's a little bit of fearlessness in there that I've, I've learned that, you know, it, it does move you forward. You have to do it the first few times in order yeah. to see that it really does kind of um, unhook you. Now, you mentioned a couple of things here, and so this is the, the last question that I wanted to ask you about and, and have you um, kind of discuss this here for everybody that's listening, um, the value of having the right people around you, you know, and, and why is that an important part of purpose? Um, you know, where, where does it fit in the, the people you surround yourself? If the people that we had, obviously, in our first parts of our life can take away our purpose or, or mask our true selves, um, you know, what do we do to change that with the people that we have around us if we want to recover it? Yeah, well, that depends on who you have around you. Um, because there are people, there are fortunately a lot of people who want the best for us, who see our potential, uh, who believe that we can do it. I mean, they have a concept of us that is uh, positive and realistic and 
a very um, they hold a re they hold a vision of reality for us where they wouldn't be surprised at all um, that you were a good poet or that you were a great writer. I mean that wouldn't that wouldn't shock them, okay? Because their concept of you is not self serving. It's that they delight in who you are as an individual. And they're excited when something happens for you because it feels like it's happening with them too, because they're along for the ride. They're your friend. So people that the purpose of a friendship is to, to bring energy into our lives. That was one of the more radical statements that, that came to me uh, toward the end of this book. Because, you know, people say, well, the purpose of friendships is to have support or the purpose of friendships is to be a good neighbor or, you know, all these different things. But your friends should lift your energy. It should not be a drain. And they're out there. I mean, there are people that are interested in the same sorts of things that you are. And thank goodness, you know, we have things like the Internet now where we can contact people all over the place that can have that kind of uh, holding the high watch for us. So yeah, your, your community is super important and nourishing those friendships with people that have that positive outlook for us is, is really essential. Uh, it can be just one person. I also want to mention for people who feel isolated or who may be very introverted that their community may be uh, a bunch of books. Like, I can't tell you how many good friends I have, you know, that, that died in the early 20th century. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yep. But, 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 but they wrote their ideas. They, they communicated something that let me know that they were on the same radio station. They were on the same wavelength and their words, you know, all these years later have been enlivening to me. So you can find, you don't have to be an extrovert to have this big community of supporters. It can be very small. It can even be in the form of your dog or your book um, or your career. It, it, it can bring that positive, um, enlivening energy to you in a bunch of different forms. And I just want to say that because I think a lot of times when we talk about community, the introverts go like, oh dear, you know, like, right. I don't know that many people. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But no, it's whatever, whatever connection with whatever living mind or living heart can give that feeling to you. That's what you're after. Mm -hmm. That's a, I, I appreciate you saying that because you're, you know, um, the idea of networking, I'm putting air quotes around that, is truly terrifying for some people, you know, and in, in order to feel like you're making good connection, you have to be vulnerable in ways that you may not be comfortable with being able to do. But, it, but there is that truthfulness, like you just said, of like you, you can become inspired, you know, through other means. It can be also listening to podcasts, right? Like you can do it in the safety of your own home Absolutely. as long as what you're doing is you're feeding yourself the right food and nutrients in order to be able to connect and help you strengthen your belief and confidence in, in, in being yourself and being your true self, you know, Absolutely. Um, watching other people, you know, kind of do it and show you that it can be done. Um, yeah. I, you know, I have one friend out there. Well, I've got a few more than one friend, but um, I do know that uh, there's a friend of mine that uh, um, I feel this sense that you talk about when we describe this, you know, when I know that I'm in that, that inner rage teenage girl is feeling trapped. I always describe my somatic responses, my chest tightens. I feel like I'm being squeezed, right? The opposite, though, I've learned that I have, that I have felt so much more in the last couple of years is, and I see that not only when I'm doing something in, in the flow with myself, but when I see other people doing it and I feel so excited for them, is it's the opposite. My, my chest feels inflated, like it feels full, like it's just going to burst. And it's a real physical feeling. Like it's not just an emotional, you know, or not just, a, you know, thinking about it kind of a thing, but I, I, I feel this sense of... Um, and I was describing it once to him is uh, laughing because, you know, he had done a song and, and it was beautiful. It was just a wonderful song that he had written. 
And as I was describing, I was telling him, I go, it's making me cry. And he's like, well, why is it doing that? And I said, well, because my heart is just so full right now that it's squeezing out through my eyes. <laughs> you know, it's like that sense of joy that comes. And I, and to feel that when you can generate that with your own activities is, and I thought about that today as I was, you know, thinking about my conversation with you. And I thought, man, that's literally the opposite of what I feel when I'm out of flow. When I'm out of flow, the chest feels tight. And when I'm in flow, it feels like I can't keep everything inside anymore. Like, and it's a, tr a genuine physical, you know, feeling it for me. Is. I, I call that the chest bloom. Yeah. Because it, yeah. it feels like something is blooming in the chest. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it must be the vibration too, right? Like, you know, just the, the vibration just causes all that, that, that real true energy in you that's, you know, just waiting to come out there. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's fantastic. And, you know, I think that what you're, what you've been doing, I would say not doing now because you've been doing this for, for many years, but bringing this back to everybody to be able to, to read and see and understand and for us to talk about this is, um, it's life changing and um, powerful on the individual level, but even then on the community level and on the family level. Um, you know, I think about the opposite experiences I want with my own kids, which is for them to see a parent living with purpose and behaving with purpose and acting with purpose and encouraging that and showing them how that's done as opposed to exactly the opposite of what I had received growing up. And then I think about how that just amplifies and, and magnifies me doing that through them and for them, allowing them to then do it themselves. And that's really important, you know? Yeah. 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 No, it's, um, you're providing uh, an essential um, service to them by doing that, by living your own life with purpose. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, Lindsay, I appreciate you so much. And, um, you know, there are many things that I'm so grateful for in my life. And I, I know I've said this to you before. And one of them was not only not only being introduced to you through your work, but then having this opportunity that just like I said, feels so unfair to be able to sit down and be able to speak with you um, <laughs> like this <laughs> um, and learn so much from you and, and for us to be able to do this for the benefit of other people that listen to uh -oh. the show. And so thank you so much for all your time today. Today's episode is longer than normal, but I, you know, it's the hundredth. So it's like, you know, if I set off balloons and doves right now I would but <laughs> oh, it's been such a pleasure to to get to share in this momentous uh, anniversary for you so to speak I, I just love talking with you and I love hearing your uh, your examples of, of your you know your own experiences with it it just makes it all come to life so thank you yeah, thank you